All right. So Rohan is the um, grounds manager for Sunnybrook Health Science Center. And it is a large, large hospital complex and research facility in the east part of Toronto, the general Toronto area. And so I'd like to turn it over to Rohan. Maybe you can talk a little bit about your background. Rohan, for example, you are an accredited, accredited um, practitioner with Seoul and you took the um, organic horticulture specialist course through Gaia College with Landscape Ontario back, it's gotta be 10 years now, right? Yep. <laughs> 10 years. So this is a journey that you've been on and we're so delighted that you're here to share that with us. Um, you're gonna talk about ecological turf grass management the how, but most important, the why. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Rohan. Oh, thank you very much, Astrid, for that introduction. And yes, I have been a member of uh, this family, this soul family for 10 years, and it has really been a wonderful experience. Um, I invite everyone in the audience of my voice to check it out. You learn new things each time, and it's just a great association. But let's see how I do this. So yes, I have learned so much from Seoul and especially this, these sessions that you have this, this month. And I encourage others to go back on your YouTube and check them out, especially um, if you're looking for information on lawn care or turf management. You have some great resources that will help bring healing to our environment or mind, body body and soul to check them out. Anyway, we are here today to get an inside view of the ecological uh, turf care in practice at Sunnybrook. But before I get into how, as Astrid has said, I would love to tell you about why we do what we do. Uh, there are conclusive researches that shows that access to green space, including turf grass, may improve levels of mental health, physical fitness, cognitive and immune function, as well as lower mortality rates and reduce several diseases, including cardiovascular and respiratory disease, anxiety and obesity. Also, but not limited to, our green space, including our turf, can mitigate the impact of environmental pollution in terms of greenhouse gas, reduction of flooding, temperature regulation, reduce energy costs in our building, especially in a hospital setting, improve air quality, and provide a green infrastructure for outside exercise, healing, relaxation, recreation, and sport. Yes, our landscape and turf play a huge role in human health and well-being. And Sunnybrook Health Science Center appreciate this scientific fact. At Sunnybrook, the turf grass is invaluable to our green space and contribute to our patients' healing process and staff mindfulness and self-care. And it can significantly help to reduce the climate shadow in our carbon footprinting of our lifestyle and our healthcare system. We are deeply aware of the connection between the health of the human civilization and the state of the natural planetary system on which it depends. So therefore, we have employed practices here at Sunnybrook that play an important role to mitigate some of the challenges facing our community from our healthcare operation. To be specific, specific our studies have found that exposure to turf grass and green space offers hospital patient benefits like improved sleep, better pain management, fewer minor complications and a reduction in post-operative stays. It provides positive benefits for people suffering from major depressive disorder and enhanced psychological well-being within minutes of exposure. Also, it enhances overall air quality as pollution and dust can deplete oxygen from the, air, from the air we breathe. And without sufficient oxygen, our bodies can experience experience exhaustion, fatigue, depression, muscle aches, joint pains, poor digestion, respiratory difficulty, and memory problems. The bottom line is our bodies need 
Oh, CJ. Hey, our turf grass and green space also may improve resistance to diabetes, heart, and respiratory disease, as reported by some Canadian researchers who recently completed um, what was believed to be the, large, the first large-scale study of links between residential proximity to greenery and mortality rates from these chronic illness. Increased amount of residential greenness, including turf grass, were associated with reduced risk of dying from several common causes of death among urban Canadians. And these are proven statistics, proven research. It also encourages interaction with the outdoor environment and increases physical activity, which are critical in maintaining a healthy, active lifestyle that help boost the immune system, increase endorphins, which they, we know are a happy hormone, and decrease stress. Knowing that obesity and sedentary lifestyle have become an epidemic in our society, encouraging outdoor activity can help address this problem. So by now you may see turf grass is not bad. How it is maintained in our North American environment is usually the culprit. The problem is the expectation and appreciation for the perfect lawn, quote unquote, perfect lawn is the problem. For many, it's a proof of status, status, status. And in many cases, an obsession that wreaks havoc on both your wallet, not my wallet, and potentially has an adverse effect on the soil, climate, and groundwater, uh, posing serious health threats to human, their pets, and wildlife. Again, I believe the problem is not with turf grass plant itself, but rather how it is maintained. So that was why we do what we do. So now let's look at how we manage our green space here as, at Sunnyvale. These are just some of our 33 acres of greens of uh, turf grass. We have a hundred acre here at our Bayview campus. So while pesticide use was already removed from the toolkit, since we have one of the country's premier cancer center and being a respected acute care hospital, the optics of using chemical was not good. However, I believe alteration based only on optics are not sustainable nor responsible. Our approach must have planetary health benefits given respect to each group in our ecosystem. Therefore, consideration were given to why we should not use pesticide and also the management of other inputs such as mineral fertilizer or potable water. So the first thing we, we, we did was to abandon mineral fertilizer use, replacing it with inputs that would improve our soil environment by increasing the microbiology and existing nutrient availability in the soil. A lot of time, it is not that the soil does not have the necessary nutrients needed for healthy plant growth, but due to pH and other factors, they are just not plant readily available. After doing a few soil tests, we decided to apply compost and the organic fertilizer alfalfa with kelp. This was an ambitious undertaking, however, on a 100 acre property. And so I had to focus on the immediate areas around the hospital building only so as not to compete with bedside care funding. It was this consideration which led me to oversee the clover mix in the outskirts or areas away from the building. My thought process then was planting the inexpensive clover mix in these areas would help fix nitrogen and fertilize the grass. Also, since it requires much less water to stay green all summer and it would outcompete weeds, I thought this was a great idea. Oh, oh, was I wrong? I was chastised for introducing weeds and bees to the lawn. Today, however, when you visit these areas as seen in the picture on your left, the grasses in these areas are much greener and even maintain its color during the hot summer months. And it's an aim for over 30,000 honeybee apiary on campus. Since then, I've noticed a clover population has been reducing significantly 
as the era thickens, and I have not really looked into the cause yet. Maybe Astrid may want to talk about that at, at a later time. Mm. <laughs> Composting. Another point of interest was the use of our own compost that was generated on site as part of our zero yard waste program. Nothing leaves the canvas, and the goal is eventually that nothing comes on the property either. We're striving to be self-sufficient. Right now, as indicated earlier, we do purchase some alfalfa fertilizer as a transitional input. Eventually, I believe by returning all leaves and clippings to the soil, the soil might organism will fertilize our plants. I want to make a slight digression, but I have to elaborate on an unexpected result we experienced. Initially in 2007, when I decided to change abruptly to an organic program, I top dressed with compost to help reduce water use to improve water holding capacity and supply nutrients for both plants and microorganisms in the soil. You know, the textbook approach. What resulted, however, was a pleasant surprise. The areas we had top dressed with compost had a drastic reduction in dandelions and planting. Not only that, but there were a few areas that were having repeated issues with chinch bug that were now staying green during the summer. The chemistry of what took place, I must confess, I have not yet gotten around to explore. Again, Astrid, they wanna poke at it for us. <laughs> I'm putting you under pressure, Astrid, sorry. <laughs> But now I appreciate the importance of soil nutrition even more in managing those culturally despised plants we refer to as weeds. You see, our focus was not on fertilizing the turf grass, but rather to increase the soil biology, including microorganisms, and let them do the work the creator intended. Feed the soil dwelling organism and they will feed the turf grass. By doing that, we not only started to regenerate a pre-urbanization soil condition, but actually helped to manage storm and rainwater with the grass root playing an especially significant role in protecting our, our runoff. Next, there are a few other adjustments we made apart from applying compost, such as applying mycorrhizae to the existing turf, at the time of overseeding. Note, I did not apply mike to bare soils as I figured once they come out of dormancy, these fungus can only live in association with plants and needed plant roots for their food supply. So I only apply mike to existing turf areas. I may have been wrong in that thinking, but that's what we did. We also introduced compost tea a few times per year to areas that include in our garden beds. And after the first few years, we have stopped aerating so as to disturb the soil and its inhabitants as little as possible. I did not want to sever the fungal strands that are established uh, to access water and nutrients from deep within the soil. I haven't yet started, but I'm looking into doing liquid aeration, hopefully over time. And I believe over time, as the microbial population is increased, soil water only capacity will increase also and will reduce the needs for irrigation, fertilizer, and even aeration. That's my hope. With so seeding, we uh, avoided use of the high maintenance varieties such as Kentucky bluegrass. Rather, we overseeded with a drought and insect tolerant grass type that has deep roots. This grass type and the increased soil microbiology hopefully will reduce the fertilizing and irrigation needs as mentioned before. Yes, a lot is still an undesirable monocrop, but here at Sunnybrook, it is a relevant factor in providing healthcare to our patients and staff members. If any um, consolation, I, uh, I have and still am reducing the amount of turf grass area, keeping it in areas primarily based on functionality rather than aesthetics. Since 2005, I have installed an additional 185 shrubs, perennial, and flower beds, and planted over 30, 1,300 trees to help the campus to be more multi-story and biodiversified. Another point is each time we overseed and germination has started, we apply kelp as a shot of useful trace elements and growth hormone to the turf. 
The plan is also to reintroduce clover and some other flowering alternate large species closer to the apiarian arboretum and to our outskirt fields to not only provide nectar for our bees, but to fix nitrogen in these lawn areas, thus removing the need for fertilizing. More in regime. This was done rather than on a weekly basis. It was done on an as needed basis to prevent undue plant injury and water need due to moisture loss. On our days, we avoid mowing, which not only help to keep the crown cool, but conserve moisture loss from the soil and, and from the cut damaged plant cells. Another reason, apart from st storm water management, why water only in, in the soil was of such importance was because we return the clippings and that act as a mulch and that act as organic matter to help retain our rainfall because we are non irrigated uh, property. Also, um, I should also mention that, that we try not to move below three inches and we do more higher in, in the summer. Irrigation, even though we appreciate that um, not only plants in the soil need water, but microorganisms do as well. It has been very challenging to ensure that all the organisms in the soil have enough water. With direction from some industrial leaders such as Janet and Chris from Seoul, we have implemented some future landscaping practices as potable water usage is scorned upon badly. Even though we know our soil microbes do need water in very dry periods. And this it was another reason why we chose um, our deep rooted grass as our grass of choice. So, since we have introduced organic inputs, the following benefits were realized. The property has looked greener, especially during the summer months. Weeds have been drastically reduced since incorporating compost application. It should be noted, however, the practice of applying um, compost was not a one-time application. It was over a couple, couple of seasons, couple of season, or a couple of applications. We had noticed uh, a significant reduction in maintenance practice due to the slower, more consistent growth to both the turf and other plantings. Because previously in the spring, twice per week, mowing would be needed to maintain a manicure look, which was challenging and unnecessary. But since we have introduced our organic um, inputs, we, we realized that one mowing in the spring, in the heights of the spring, was sufficient. Also, due to slower and more timely growth, fewer clippings are generated, making it much easier to mulch and refers grass cycle, returning valuable nutrients to the soil. Less fertilizer usage. We have reduced our organic fertilizer input to just one application as against the three mineral application previously used. Another advantage of organic fertilizer, if I may just interject here, is that it can be applied without the need for a soil test as they contain a wide spectrum of nutrients and we do not have to concern ourselves too much about correcting pH. Although I have no documented research findings, I have noticed a significant drop in certain disease and pest problems, such as white grubs and chinch bugs. While we still notice the presence of white grubs though, our turf root system is so developed that it seems these insects can, can coexist without any apparent visual damage. The turf areas which add chinch bug almost every summer prior to our organic program no longer reflect any insect activity and is actually satisfactorily greener during the hot summer months without irrigation. Being in a hospital um, environment, noise is of imp paramount importance. And because there's less cleanup, less mowing, that reduces our noise and air pollution. 
The health of our turf, shrubs, perennial and trees is significantly improved from a visual perspective. We have also noticed an increase in acceptable wildlife, including frogs and earthworms. And we have observed a recent increase uh, also in butterflies, bees, um, birds, and these pollinators are great indicators of the health of our landscape here at Sunnybrook. So to wrap up and to be specific, the turf grass at Sunnybrook is the perfect invitation to get staff, patient and visitors outdoor. Imagine, there is no way we could entertain a substantial number of over 12,000 plus staff outdoor at any one time to enjoy the healing benefits that our green space provides without our turf areas. On days, seeing staff sprawling on the turf areas having their break and exercising self-care from compassion fatigue or recovering from exhaustion from COVID-related assignment is just so welcoming and heartwarming. Without turf, we just could not provide enough spacious, oxygen-rich seating area otherwise. The irony I have noticed, though, is though they may be sitting on the turf enjoying the beautiful gardens, the birds, the pollinators, mature trees, they do that without appreciating the functionality of these great green resources beneath them. Maybe because the conventional carbon emitting and biodiversity reducing maintenance practices have robbed turf grass of its due respect and role in our health and well being. So, my takeaway points for today we have beautiful, healthy, low maintenance landscape and lawns without using conventional fertilizer and pesticide. Every day, patients and their family and staff use the green space and the lawns around the hospital as a place of escape reflection, enjoyment, and healing. Once we realize and address that our soil microbes play a pivotal role in the health of our plants, we got results never before experienced with previous practices. Once we embrace the fact that land care is not about avoiding the use of chemicals or warfare against pests, but rather about the health and welfare of all organisms, including plants in our green space and soil, we were able to create beautiful, sustainable landscape. A grass lawn, as a part of the bigger multi-story landscape picture, appeals to the passion of both the affective and the cognitive person. One knows nothing about the healing benefits of green space, but just loves being in it, and the other, who learn about nature and its restorative and preventive healing benefits, and they have disciplined themselves to interact with nature. Without education, such as this forum provided by Seoul or Gaia College, we will not be able to reverse the damages caused by conventional practices. And if our turf and landscape isn't healthy, the inherent healing benefits cannot be realized by our aging and growing population. So with, with our proper knowledge of the true functionality of turf grass managing an ecological sustainable way, we run the risk of losing not only turf space, but also garden beds to hospital beds. We have noticed, like in humans, proper nutrition, soil management is the fundamental tool in creating and maintaining a healthy, environmentally friendly and sustainable landscape that yields. At Sunnybrook, we have changing narratives. Our focus is not just on those working in scrubs, but also on those working with turf grass and shrubs when it matters most. Thank you very much for your attention. Excellent, excellent, wonderful. Love the slides and um, Rowan, you have a garden named after you, the Healing Garden. Yes, I do. That's pretty amazing. Tell us about that one. Well, it was um, a prize for being on the Undercover Boss Canada. That was my gift from the hospital. And knowing my drive to uh, um, portray the message that our landscape yields, the senior management thought this would be an appropriate gift so that message could live, outlive me. So I really welcome that, that endeavor, that venture, yes. 
Well, that's very special. Congratulations. I'm sure it wasn't just a bed of roses all the way to where you are now. Um, yeah, that's good having that slide, your resources. What were your big challenges on this journey? Getting started. Well, the big challenge is really to get well, education, really to get people to appreciate that um, pesticide isn't the, the answer. It's actually a detriment. And trying to convince them that a conventional style of managing landscape is actually affecting our own health and also the health of our environment. Once we were able to um, articulate that to our audience, especially our community here, it was a much e easier um, to implement. And the first thing we did actually in, if, on that resource is that we did a book, that connection between the landscape and health, and we printed 5,000 copies the very first time, and that did great in, in um, sending the message out to our community. Yeah, I believe we actually have a digital version of it on our website under resources on the Seoul website as well. So you guys can check it out. I'd like to just um, remind everybody, this is a time for questions now for Rowan and uh, we can take your questions in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask directly. Nick has posted a question for you. Um, what are your main inputs for your compost tea? Do you have any secret ingredients? Uh. Well, um, Christine is Christine, Christina, Christine, Christine from the Nicolick? yes, from the organic pantry. Yes, so she prepared a nice brew for me, and um, shipped it out to me. Then I brew it. Um, so we have our EM um, kelp. Um, thanks, Nick, for the question. Catch me off guard. <laughs> um, our organic molasses. Um, humic acids, um, seed crop, which is uh, sea extract. Uh, I'm missing something now. <laughs> so what is it? Sorry, I missed what you said that you got from Christina to start off. What did you buy from her? Oh, so she sent me this um, mixture, like, I mean, this all the components, like all the ingredients for this mixture. And then okay. she, yes. So she sent the compost, the kelp, sea crop, humic acid, molasses, um, EM, and, in the, and said also the proportion that I need to brew. Okay, great. So it's, she sort of does the recipe herself and ships it ready to go. You just extend it. That's correct. Well, that is uh, brilliant. Um, and it takes a lot of the guesswork out of it because she's doing this a lot and she knows what works. I That's figure, it. yes. Yeah, the Organic Gardener's Pantry, if you don't know about it, .ca, organicgardenerspantry.ca. She's a great supplier of organic um, nutrients and other things for us practitioners. So um, she's got great information on her website, additional to the products that she makes available. Great. Well, I didn't know that, and I must check that out because I always try to concoct my own, but it is time consuming. So that is a big time saver for you guys with all the acres you have. Well, and one of the thing too, I mean, we can do our own, but you have to be careful of the compost that you start with, yeah. that you're, you're not populating anaerobic um, bacteria. So I figure I'll just go through her, get the correct stuff, then I don't have the problem to determine what's in my compost. Right, right. Really, you, you'd want to <laughs> test your compost before you actually use it as a compost tea. You right. could be spreading problems. Very good point. And I know Elaine Ingham makes a point of that um, very often that you, you, you can't just guess at what you've got. You've got to, you've got to test it. And testing facilities are cropping up all uh, over the country. Um, there are more and more options. Just a few years back, I was doing that kind of testing 
and sending it all to the US because there was really nothing much available in Canada, but now we have lots in Canada. And uh, you're hearing from many of them over these past few uh, weeks and months. Um, and especially, especially if you want to test for your microbiology, the soil, uh, there wasn't much here in Canada at the time. Right. Because when, when we did that first in 2005, we actually sent it to the States. And then we were wondering, oh, oh, um, dreading was the result. Give it, it took two days to get to the lab. <laughs> yes, yes, I found that too. Um, great, but you are, you are, um, by using the compost tea, you are by fact extending your compost. So you, you probably never have enough to do what you always need to do. So that extends it, right? Sorry. That's correct, yeah. Um, another question for you, Rowan. What was the connection with compost top dressing and dandelions you mentioned? Yeah, so that's rather interesting. So I'm just figuring maybe it has something to do with um, uh, pH correction or, or, or things like that. Because when we applied, we had no, it was not intended for weed control. It was intended for uh, uh, increasing soil moisture content, um, water only capacity, and to provide some fertilizer. So we top dressed heavily uh, um, over two seasons. And by the second spring, we noticed all the areas that we apply the compost. I had no dandelions, I had very few dandelions. And so I, I repeated the experiment now after seeing this. I said, okay, let's see if it was a fluke. And I tried in other areas. And in subsequent season, the same thing happened. There was no dandelions nor planting there. And matter of fact, there was one area that had clover, and the clover disappeared also. So I said, well, there's something that's happening there. I didn't really get too much into the chemistry, but I figured it has something to do with the soil chemistry being um, checked, be bringing to neutrality. And because dandelion, as you know, in these plants, they're like um, indicator plants. They tell you when something is lacking in the soil. So obviously, you know, calcium has been available now, um, nitrogen was available now, so the plant was not needed anymore. That's how nature works. Yeah, absolutely. That is just um, exactly what we would expect to have happen. If you take care of the soil, and you said this a few times in your presentation, then the soil, he healthy soil takes care of the nutrients for the plants and you have healthy plants. So you're not going in plant focused. I want healthy plants. You, you're going in, I want healthy soil. Soil. And by continuously feeding your soil microbes with organic matter by leaving the clippings and leaving the correct amount because you're not cutting too short or waiting too long, you've got good organic matter cycling and a continuous supply of food for those soil microbes. And so a healthy soil, weeds don't have a job in a healthy soil because weeds are going to go where unhealthy soil exists, that's their job. So yeah, exactly. You see less clover, you see less dandelions, less other weeds. I, I experience that myself all the time. And um, it's the simplest thing. A healthy lawn crowds out weeds, but you don't get to a healthy lawn using synthetic fertilizers. No. And even though you do have some inputs. This is a question I'm wondering about. Even if you have some cost for inputs, it's how does it compare to the cost of the inputs you were um, using before, like the mineral fertilizers and all that? Okay, that's a very, very good question. So initially, when um, we started, it was a little bit challenging because we didn't have like a, a formula. It was a test, um, a test. So like the cost of the compost and the, the alfalfa and stuff we were applying, the cost overrun the mineral fertilizer we used a season before. But after seeing the results, the second year, it offset. The, the, the result offset the cost the first year. And not only that, 
subsequent years, we didn't have to put that amount of compost for one. Also, we didn't have to put, because we started with two applications of alfalfa for the season, then we reduced to one. So now it is actually now cheaper than the mineral fertilizer in subsequent years. But the initial year, yes, it was a little bit more expensive, but the result far outweighs the cost. Well, that's huge. I would think any uh, executive wonder, wondering about budgets is going to perk up to that information, and that's reason enough. So how long would you say it took to see the results when you switched your practices? How, did, did it take years? Or how, how, what was the time timing? Oh, for, for, the, for the dandelions, if I will start there, but by the very next season, there was a reduction, but not complete extinct. Um, in terms of the color and the thickness, it took like about two seasons before I really got a real thick standoff grass. And I know, you know, there may be some that still say, you know, it's a, mo it's a monocropping and the disadvantage of monocropping. But as I explained earlier, in our environment here, we need turf grass, because that's where we bring our, 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 our patients and stuff out of the turf grass to, to walk and to enjoy. So this was a, a platform that we needed to accentuate our health care here. So how could we do that one into a, 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 um, a safe way that, does, that doesn't cause allergy sufferers problem, doesn't cause um, any um, sensitivity to pesticide or stuff like that. So that's why we had to get away from the pesticide one, get away from allergy causing um, bluegrass and stuff. Even though the grass we use, it does produce seeds also, but it only produces seed when it's in excess growth. Right. So these are some of the considerations we do so we can bring patients outside. Because it's one thing to bring patients outside into our environment with all these pollens. You know, just like I mean, oak tree, great trees, don't get me wrong, oak are beautiful, but we keep our oak trees to the back end of our property just because of the pollens. And, you know, we have no wind pollinated perennials, we use all insect pollinated, just a little things like that. So it's a complete ecosystem and not just address turf grass or address this plant. How does everything fit together? Yeah, lots of very interesting considerations. I, I love that holistic approach that you're thinking about everybody, including the human, just the, the allergy part of it. That I, it never even occurred to me. And um, yeah, it, it you know, for for uh, for the kind of facility you are to have it be the most healing space it can be makes perfect sense, and yet it wasn't obvious until you started really playing with it, right? That's by accident. <laughs> yeah, and then you don't have to put up those warning signs to people to stay off the grass because it was just sprayed. <laughs> Right. As a matter of fact, we have signs to come and enjoy the grass. And we actually do have signs, you see. <laughs> oh, that is just awesome. Okay, well, um, it's such a, a great um, case study. And there was um, a summary of your first three years written up in the Ontario Parks Association journal that is also on the SOUL website under the resources tab that people can follow along what you actually did for the first three years and um, see the evidence. And now this is um, this talk has been recorded for everybody to go back to and share. Um, and we, we've got to just improve turf care all across the board because then we increase water holding capacity and goodness knows we've got a lot of um, very strong rain events. We've had a very wet spring already. And if your soil is healthy, it's able to hold more water. And that's really key. And, and it helps with um, irrigation as well. Lots less irrigation. So many good points, Rowan. Very, very inspiring. Thank you so much. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left. If anybody's got anything else to add or any other questions, um, 
we're still here and uh, yeah. And one thing I had to, I mean, maybe it was covered in my presentation also is that we, weeds is a reflection of your soil nutrition, we have been said, the same. So if the, if the soil nutrition doesn't suit the grass plant, nature gonna, gonna fill it in with something. So as, so as to feed the microorganisms into the soil. And we refer to these plants as weeds because they are the undesirable. So if you really want your grass plant per se to go, ensure that the soil has the nutrients to support your, your, your and I, I don't mean by adding, but um, by adding compost, by adding your micro um, yeah. things that will harvest the nutrients for that plant. Because if that plant does not, is not healthy or doing well, you will get weed. Right, very good point. And with that, uh, it reminds me that some uh, turf grass companies, the seed suppliers, have been experimenting by coating seed with endophytic mycorrhizal fungi so that it's already there when you plant the seed and they wake up together. The, the grass seed germinates and the, the fungal spores germinate. And so you can, you can buy seed like that, or you can apply it like Rowan did after the fact in existing turf. And in fact, we're going to find out more innovations like that next week when my guest will be um, a researcher from Vineland Research Center in um, Niagara, Ontario, where it's the Turf Grass Institute, and we're going to hear about some innovations that fit in the ecological um, perspective. So stay tuned, join us next week. Thank you so much, Rowan. Thank you everybody for joining us. And uh, don't forget, um, the recording is going to be up in a few days and share it widely. So have a great week, everyone. Enjoy the beautiful weather. That's over thank and out you. for me. And thank you, Rowan. Have a great day. Very welcome, same to you, thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.